Ah, finally. Okay, so, so let me just stop. I want to go over. I, I, by the way, um, as I mentioned before, when I see small mistakes with my notes, uh, I correct them and, and upload them. I haven't uploaded, I've done a few corrections. One to mechanical properties solutions. This page of my mechanical properties notes, and also I noticed some mistakes with st uh, static equilibrium notes. So I'll be uploading those. But in any case, you need to check regularly on Moodle and my Google Drive, you know, for updates. As I, as I say, as I see small corrections, I, I change things. Now what I've changed here, to be clear, before I do it on the whiteboard, I've changed the definition here. I've removed the tan phi because the, the proper accurate definition Where is it? Is this the displacement of the upper face relative to the lower face uh, divided by the original length L naught? This is the strict accurate definition. But people use a small angle approximation. This and this is what I've written here. Basically, I've emphasized um, that when we we use tan phi, it's a small angle approximation. Uh, I'll show you this more clearly on the whiteboard a bit bigger, but basically when this thing slopes down, the length becomes the height, this height becomes the hypotenuse. So the angle we should be using is that L0 is the hypotenuse, DL is my displacement from there to there, so sine phi is the more accurate uh, is the more accurate thing to use. But for small angles, um, sine phi is approximately equal to tan phi, and it's also approximately equal to phi itself. Let me make sure this was my pen. Let me make sure this is an approximation there. Oh, I, I can't do it on this. Um, these, are, these are approximation signs. So I want to show you this on the whiteboard more clearly. So if I take my original block, so I'm going to apply a force, the shear force, so this thing is going to change shape. So as we push this face forwards, this becomes, I don't, I'm going to exaggerate everything here so you can see. Now, the displacement is from here to here. Maybe I'll do that in red. This is now L0. L0 was originally this distance. It's not, my diagram is not to scale, so the, the distances may not look the same. But as, as you shear it, the, this side becomes a hypotenuse of the triangle. So my strain in defining, let me do that in black. My strain in defining the shear modulus, because uh, my shear modulus S is uh, stress over strain. My stress is defined as the force over the area the surface area of the, of the faces and my strain is defined as delta L over over L naught from this right angle triangle right angle triangle, you can see that sine phi is opposite over hypotenuse. 
the opposite is delta L, and hypotenuse is L naught. Now, for very small angles, generally speaking, with this shearing, the angle is very small. So in textbooks, what they'll actually show you is they'll, they'll, they'll show you that there's practically no change there because the angle is usually very small. In this case, we can use the approximation sine phi is approximately equal to tan phi and is approximately equal to the angle itself. So I took a look at survey and survey actually uses the approximation that the strain is equal to phi. In another book I use called Sears, Zimanski and Yen, he uses uh, strain to be tan phi. So you, you may see this in different textbooks. What I don't know is why they don't use sine phi, which is, uh, which, which, which is the accurate representation of DL by L naught and the angle phi. Anyway, I'll upload that uh, t today or tomorrow. So I just wanted to go over that before we go back to thermal properties. Any, any questions on that before we go on? No questions? Right. So thermal properties. We're on question eight, I think. Um, we don't need to be going too quickly. I think we're fairly okay with time. Before I go on to question eight, are there any other questions? Sir? Yeah? People ask you to read it in, in the class. Oh, sorry. Thank you. All right. So let's get back to the notes now. We're on question number eight. Before we go on, though, are there any other questions? So we don't need to rush ahead too quickly. I think we're fairly, fairly okay for time. Or shall I just carry on? I just carry on, no questions? All right then. Um, now this is the important, we're starting in the important area of, excuse me, uh, calorimetry. You, you, you very likely get questions on calorimetry, both in your tutorials, tests, and, and exams. It is not very difficult. So let's, let's start with an example then. A thermos bottle contains 150 grams of water at 4 degrees centigrade. Into this is placed 90 grams of metal at 100 degrees centigrade. After equilibrium is, is established, the temperature of the water and metal is 21 degrees centigrade. What is the specific heat of the metal? And we assume no heat, uh, no heat loss to the thermos bottle. I think you all know, you may have seen that thermos bottles, um, flasks containing coffee, coffee or tea and stuff like that. Let's just close the door. Uh, so the thermos bottle co uh, contains all the heat, so we have no heat loss. So in our calculation, we don't have to worry about that. As always, my diagram, we've got the water and the temperature of the water. The temperature, the, the metal and its temperature, Tm. Then we have the final equilibrium temperature. Remember, as we put the hot metal into the cooler water, the heat as we know, goes from hot to cold. So there'll be an exchange of heat. Um, normally with these things, you're gonna stick a, th a thermometer in there and you see the thermometer level changing as heat is transferred from the hot to the cold. Now this takes us some time. It doesn't happen instantaneously that all the heat jumps from hot to cold. It, it flows at a certain rate, so it will take a certain amount of time. When the level of the thermometer stays fixed, it doesn't change anymore, that gives you the equilibrium temperature, the final temperature.
now as we discuss with the paddle wheel experiment which by the way i've done some calculations for it so i'm going to put that as optional for people again i'll add that to the notes um from the paddle wheel experiment we established that heat is a form of energy so all of these problems are based on the conservation of energy uh in the form of uh conservation of heat so heat lost must equal heat gain as usual i've what have i used i've converted to uh, base si units um so the heat uh, what, I, what we were saying the heat lost by the metal is absorbed by the water the metal cools and the water heats up uh, until both reach the final uh, temperature the final equilibrium temperature tf so heat is lost by the metal so you have the specific by the way do you want me to do this in the whiteboard or is this straightforward enough we can do it in the whiteboard if you want whiteboard well, let's, let's do that all right it's all based on as i say on conservation of energy in fact i i'll emphasize that let me put start by energy lost this is question eight equals energy gained and this goes in the form of heat lost equals heat gained now we know the formula for heat lost or gained is the specific heat times the mass times the change in temperature. So I have mass M of the metal. The specific heat of the metal, this is what I'm trying to find, isn't it? Let me just see the question again. Uh, yeah, what is the specific heat of the metal? This is, so CM we don't know. Uh, we want the temperature difference. Now, since the metal is at the hotter temperature, it's going to be bigger than the final temperature, isn't it? Because it's losing heat. Now, when you use this formula, by the way, always put the bigger temperature first. So this, this quantity is always positive. So Tm is bigger than Tf, since the metal is the hot thing. The heat gained is by the water. So it's the mass of the water, specific heat of water, this time the final temperature is bigger because the water heats up so this is my equation then uh, i can do it two ways now i can make cm the subject but then there's a lot of symbols to rearrange so maybe it's easier if we put numbers in at this point um okay let me actually put the numbers in this time CM, I don't know. My mass is 0 0.09 kilograms. Again, it's a difference, so I can use degrees centigrade, so I don't have to change to Kelvin. My mass of water, 0 0.15 kilograms. Specific heat of water, 4186. and my temperature change anyway doing all this on the calculator we get 7.11 cm 10674 hello sir yeah uh, so the temperature uh, the change in temperature in the bracket so must be always positive yes if you use the equation like this let me just i'll show you in a minute if you i'll come back to your question in a minute let me write the answer down 
Okay, sir. Uh, where is it? Uh, this is Jules a kilogram. I'll convert to calories in a minute. So this is my answer then, in joules per kilogram per degree centigrade. Now the question you ask me is this. This, this also applies when you're using conservation of energy, by the way. So what I'm going to say now also applies when, I, when you're using conservation of energy in, in, in other mechanical problems. If I have the equation in this form, which I hope none of you are going to use, I mean, I'm not sure if, if you've come across this way. Uh, let me write it the other way around. Because heat gain will be positive. If you have it in this form, then this has to be plus and the heat loss has to be minus. Now, personally, I, I, I never advise you to use this because all we need to do is to take this across the equal sign and the minus becomes a plus. So we end up with heat loss equals heat gain. So if I rewrite this across the equal sign, I get heat gain equals heat lost. But this time the minus becomes a plus. And then I also prefer writing it this way around. Heat lost equals heat gained. So in answer to your question, when you use it like this, you must always arrange for the temperature to be positive. Yeah, is that clear? Yes, sir. Right, so let's so, uh, now that you know... Go ahead. I also have a question. Go ahead. Um, on, can you use the formula, this, this formula like uh, mass multiplied by specific, specific its capacity and then uh, multiplied by change in temperature is equals to negative of mass uh, multiplied by the uh, specific heat capacity and then multiplied by change in temperature again. But just put, like the way you have written your formula, light, light and then just put the negative sign to the other other side and the other side becomes positive. I'm not I'm not very sure I've understood your question. Um, uh, the way you have written your formula. Let me, which way do you want me to start? From here or from here? Uh, from the, the, where you, you have written M, M, M. I tell you CM. what. M. Listen, I'm going to write it in green. Tell me what you want me to write. I'm writing this. Then what? Go ahead. You multiply it with uh, the change in temperature. What, delta T? Yes, sir. Like that? Yes, sir. And then equal to negative M C change in temperature again. Uh, M C not M and then specific heat capacity. Oh wait, wait a minute. Specific heat is normally C, huh? Yes, mass sir. mass of water, specific heat of water, and then temperature change like this. Yes, sir. But this is wrong. But if if you if you place in the numbers, it's coming out the same. Yeah, but you're, what you're doing is confusing things by changing things around. Really, I, I know what you, you're going to do. You're going to reverse the. You're going to put the temperatures in the same to the same direction, isn't it? That's why. I, so you're going to end up with the correct answer. So what you're doing is not wrong, but it's also it's also highly confusing. So let me rub this out. Look, it's up to you how you want to do it. But I suspect what you're you're doing is this. You're putting a minus sign there, and then you're writing TW minus TF, right? So this will come out to be negative, and then the minus minus will come out to be a plus. But why do you want to confuse things like that? 
Do you get my point? The young man, is that what you want to do? Yes, sir. I but do why, get your point. Yeah, but why do why do that when the thing is this? It's up to you. If you if you find it easier to do it that way, then do it that way. But I would advise this. When you write the equation heat lost equals heat gained, just arrange the bigger temperature to come first so the two numbers are positive. And then everything works out. The main thing you have to rem you see them you can put the minus sign only when you start using heat lost and heat gained in this way. Is it is this not easier? Is this not easier to do it this way? Forgetting about the minus sign and just making sure that both sides are positive? It's very easy, sir. Yeah. So let me recommend you do that, huh? But as I say, I won't force anyone. If you, if you can find the right way of doing it, I strongly suspect in the stress of an exam, you'll mix up the minus signs and get the wrong answer. And it's the same thing with energy. What, what, when you write it like this, always make sure your energies are positive. When you subtract kinetic energies, for example, always make sure that you have the bigger thing first. So when you subtract, you end up with a positive answer. Okay, the last thing is to show you the conversion. Um, I'll do this in a different color. We can also express this in calor calories per gram per degree centigrade. Uh, so I want to show you that conversion. So let me do it like this. The reason I'm showing you this is because in questions you, you get it, you can see it in both using both units. Generally speaking, I prefer base SI units, but sometimes it's easier to use calories. So anyway, we've got this in joule. Let me put my units in properly. We've got this in Joules. This time I'm going to write the kilograms and degrees underneath. I hope you understand this notation. The minus one means the same thing. It's a fraction, isn't it? And degrees centigrade. Now I want to convert to from joules to calories. Uh, let us remind ourselves that one calorie equals 4.186 joules. One joule So now I want joules to go to calories. I'm going to put brackets. One joule is equal to this. One kilogram is a thousand grams. So brackets. One kilogram, a thousand grams. The degree of centigrade stay the same. Again, I can easily use Kelvin uh, there as well. And what I do now, I divide 10674 by this number and this number. Sorry about this. Uh, this was, there was no point doing that. I've already done the division, so I don't need to do that. I can use the 15. I've already divided this, so I don't need to. So 1501 divided by this and divide by this and we end up with 0 0.3585 calories per gram per degree centigrade. Okay, so that's how you want if you want to convert from one thing to the to the other. A any questions on that? So I have a question. Go ahead. What's the approximate value of one calorie? 
Because I've come across some question papers and they show that it's 4.184, if I'm not mistaken. Um, okay, let me take you to survey to convince you. The 184 is not correct. Oh, if you see people, I don't see people when I'm on the whiteboard. Let me just bring up survey so we, we check survey. This is, uh, so this is from my earlier stuff. Uh, where are we? Let's just check. So uh, is, I don't know which edition you're using, but uh, they're pretty similar. Uh, general physics, where is it? And let's have a look. Uh, mechanically equivalent of heat somewhere. Let's look at the calorie. Caloric. Calorie. Yeah. Let me write that down so I won't forget the page. Uh, so two on two. And six oh six. Let's try six oh six. This is the paddle wheel experiment. Calculations I've done, by the way, are not quite the same as uh, here in Surrey, which is a bit. I've expanded the calculation a bit. So just to be clear, this is the correct value there, 4.186. One calorie is 4.186. I have another book as well. I won't go through it because it'll take time. But even my other book is the same. It's the same value. So I really don't know where they're getting 4.184. Um, if you're in a test or an exam, though, the worry is you probably have to use the value they give you in the test or the exam, even if the best thing is to put your hand up and to ask uh, the invigilators. Huh? Uh, is that clear? Yes, sir. Actually, that's where my debate came in, because on the question paper I was having, it was showing that the specific heat capacity as well as the the one calorie is equal to 4.184 instead of the 4.186. Let me, let me ask you a question so we don't confuse things. This is the, okay, this is a, 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 a four significant figure approximation, by the way. But the four significant figures, this is the correct, uh, the correct thing. The one calorie. But if you're talking about specific heats of substances, it might be different. Is that what you're worrying about? Is it like from here, is it? Specific heats of some substances. Is this where you're seeing the difference or is it here? Where is it? This is just a definition of a calorie or, or at least a measured equivalence. But when you come to specific heats, they may vary a bit. So which one are you worrying about? The specific heat of a substance or the calorie itself? The calorie itself, sir. Uh, then it's 4.186. Okay. Professor. Yeah? Um, I think they got it from Butch, because Butch says one calorie is equal to 4.184 joules. 184 joules. 4.18. Four Jews. That's what Butch says. One calorie. Um, do you want me to check in another book as well? I don't know. This is a number that I. 
I trust this one a bit more. I, do you want me to check in a few more books or shall I check later for you? You can check it and then you can, right. yes. Let me check. I've got a couple of other books I'll check. I have some more advanced books as well. I'll have a look. In, there's a, there's a, a very good book by Zemansky. Uh, the one version is, is Zemansky. A newer version, simplified a bit, by Dittman and Zemansky. I'll check those. Those are classic thermodynamics books, so I'll check that. All right, then. Uh, if it's in an exam, though, ask the invigilator, but you probably better just use the value that's in your exam paper. Don't try and second guess. So that's the best advice I can give you. Um, let's go back to this now. Okay, is the calculation clear? Uh, any questions or is it straightforward? Okay, I don't hear any questions. Um, Oh, oh, there's another correction I have forgot to do. This is should be I think should be question nine. Um, I've corrected this, but I haven't. Again, I'll do that today or tomorrow. I'll make these small corrections and uh, and upload. Uh, question nine then. A 200 gram copper calorimeter can contain can contain 150 grams of oil at 20 degrees centigrade. To the oil is added 80 grams of aluminium at 300 degrees centigrade. Determine the final equilibrium temperature. And we're given the specific heat of the calorimeter, which is made of copper. Um, and we're giving it, we're giving it in calories per gram per degree centigrade, and specific heat of aluminium, specific heat of oil, and we've got to find the final equilibrium temperature. Again, the starting point is exactly the same: conservation of energy. This time round, I've chosen to keep to these units because it's a lot of converting all of these things. You, you saw yourself; it's, it takes a bit of time. You can convert if you want, but on this occasion, I just thought it's easier to stay with grams, uh, grams and calories. And as long as I stick with grams and calories throughout, uh, I'll have my answer in, in terms of grams, calories, and degrees centigrade. Again, it's heat lost equals heat gained. Can anyone tell me the difference between this calculation we're going to do now and the previous one? They're very similar, aren't they? But there's one difference. Can anyone tell me what the difference is? We have to consider the mass of the copper calorimeter. Exactly that. The calorimeter, you see, the, with a thermos flask, the, the thermos flask is an insulator. So the amount of heat that gets transferred is negligible. But with a calorimeter, and when you use a calorimeter, by the way, it's normally enclosed in insulating material. So the way oh, please, can you explain what you're from saying again? Uh, repeat your question. Repeat your question. I'm asking you to repeat what you said. All right, then. Let me go to the whiteboard. Do you understand? the difference between insulating materials and conducting materials? If we have a material such as glass, or, you know, this kind of um, cotton wool kind of stuff, these things don't transmit heat easily. So they're kind of insulating materials. Let me just say, are bad conductors of heat.
So if you get questions where you have like a glass beaker, they normally say neglect the heat transferred to the glass beaker. This is because glass is a bad conductor. And in calorimetry questions, or when you're using a calorimeter, this is copper, which is a good conductor. Oh yes, and by the way, uh, copper, basically metals, copper, iron, metals in general, these are good conductors of heat. Uh, so when you have a copper color image like this, it's normally surrounded by insulating material so that you stop heat escaping to the surroundings. If you don't stop heat escaping to the surroundings, then the heat loss equals heat gain. You have to consider the surroundings, uh, which makes the calculation very bad. So even when you get questions with a calorimeter, and they just draw the calorimeter like that, they're assuming that it's insulated, so no heat is lost from the calorimeter. But if you leave the calorimeter like this, you're going to lose heat to the surrounding air. So in such questions with the calorimeter, they're assuming it's insulated, even closed at the top. However, they don't always go and draw all of this stuff in every question. Um, but you can tell from the question usually, uh, it should say neglect heat given to the container. If it's glass, now a thermos flask is designed, you know yourselves, that if you have a thermos flask with coffee, there's a kind of a vacuum, there's a layer of vacuum, isn't it, between the two walls. And of course, where, where there's a vacuum, the conduction of heat is very, very small, well, negligible in fact, except by, by some small amount of radiation. Is that, is that what you wanted me to repeat? That's perfect, I think. Okay. Uh, where am I? Anyway, so even in this question, I can just draw it. We're assuming that this is insulated. So we're assuming there's another. And in, if you go to, when you go do your experiments in the lab and you look at a calorimetry, you'll see there's insulation around it. Then, then you cover it with some wooden wooden uh, top. The top has a hole in it so you can put a thermometer in there and you can read off the temperature from the thermometer. All of this is assumed in these questions. All right, so the difference then in this question is that we're also considering the heat that's gained by the calorimeter. Otherwise the question is identical. Again, is it straightforward or do I need to do this on the whiteboard? Anyway, let me do it on here and then tell me afterwards. Wait, Professor, I want to find out something. Go ahead. So we are adding the the whole calculation of uh, the, what do you call this, the calorimeter Y because it's also affecting the heat or? It's absorbing heat. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, the calorimeter being metal, first of all, the calorimeter will be at the same temperature as the oil. Because remember, what's happening is, the, uh, you, you start off with the, the oil in the calorimeter, and they start off at the, temperature, the same temperature, and then you put the hot thing afterwards. So I haven't shown this. So this starts out by itself, and then you put the hot thing in. Um, but when you put the hot thing in, because it's metal and it's a conductor, it absorbs heat as well as the, as the oil. All right, so we've got heat loss equals heat gained again. Now I'm always going to arrange for the higher temperature to be first, so this subtraction becomes a, is, ends up as a positive number. Now the hot thing is the aluminium. So the hot thing will be bigger than the, the final equilibrium temperature. Um, so the heat loss then is massively aluminium 
specific heat of aluminium and a temperature difference, AL, TAL is bigger than TF. Now this is the oil, the heat gained by the oil. And again, TF is higher than T0. And also the calorimeter itself also gains some of the heat. So we have to include this. And again, the bigger temperature goes first. And then I'm just pushing in the numbers and making TF the subject. Now is this straightforward or do you want to see it on the whiteboard? Whiteboard, sir. Is it difficult? All right. Um, let's do that. So, yeah. Why? Why? So, why is it that uh, the the copper thing in the the liquid, like the masses, can't be added together? Because the specific heats are different. You you can't uh, you can't love the two things together because when you're looking at the amount of heat that the calorimeter gains it will depend on its specific heat, isn't it? So I can't yeah. add the masses together because you will simply end up with uh, something, something that's meaningless. It has to be separated. If the specific heats were the same, then you could add everything together. Yes, you could. But only if specific heats are identical, which they are not. Anyway, it's not the calorimeter. It's the calorimeter and the oil. Sorry. Yeah. It's because... It, I don't know what I said before, but it's, it's oil and copper. All right, let me write the equation at least on the whiteboard. But I think I'll jump the numbers though. Um, it's heat lost equals heat gained. In any question, you can always tell what is lost. The hotter thing loses uh, heat, and the colder things gain the heat. So it's the uh, hot aluminium that loses heat, and we know that the amount of heat that it loses is ml, specific heat of ml. Uh, the temperature of the alum aluminium is hotter, so I'll make that go first. So this is a positive number. Now the mass of the oil. Specific heat of oil. This time TF is bigger, so it, it comes first. Minus T naught. So again, I have a positive number. Plus the mass of the copper calorimeter. Specific heat of copper. Let's see, I should put. Uh, since the calorimeter and the oil start out at the same temperature, the temperature difference is the same. I mean, you can pull out. I'm not quite sure. If, let me do this in a different color. What, maybe what the young man was asking me before. Is this what you wanted to do? M oil, C oil, plus. If you want to pull out the temperature as a common factor, you can. Uh, so then I can do this. Is this what you were asking me before? I can't do the, the I can't add the masses themselves, but I can add the mass times specific heat plus mass times specific heat. Uh, if you want to do that, you can do that. But anyway, let's just stick with this. Look, uh, putting the numbers in now, because I know all of these numbers. The only thing I don't know is the TF. So what I'll do. I'll put in the numbers and calculate as much as I can, and then I'll do the, re the rearrangements. So let me pick it up from, right. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna expand this bracket and push the numbers in, and this will give me 
this will give me five zero do you want to understand that if I multiply this by this I know these three numbers this gives me this answer then this gives me 16.8 uh, TF um, what have I done there well, actually what I have done is to take the TF out as a as a factor um, in fact, I did do this, so let me write it. So in fact, I found it easier to do this, and then what did I get? I've got TF minus T0 was 20. So I have TF. And then putting the numbers and calculate, because I know all of these numbers, that comes to 74.1. Is this all clear without me doing all the steps in between and putting the numbers in and then multiplying? Is this okay? It's fine, sir. Yes, right. it's fine. Okay, so let's... I'll do the final rearrangements, though. 16.8 TF uh, equals 74. Expanding the bracket now. Again, when I multiply this number together, let me make sure I don't make any mistakes here. 20 times, this gives me 1482. One, so I'm expanding and multiplying. Now I need to collect the temperature on one side of the equation. So I have 74.1 TF. This comes across, becomes a plus. This is 5040 becomes cross becomes a plus this thing and so when I do my numbers I get six five two two and then you can see TF it's gonna be six five two two It's too close, that's it. And that gives me 71 point. And now I'll give my answer for three significant figures, 71.7 degrees centigrade. Um, any questions on that? So anyway, this is, uh, that's this question. Uh, well time, well, time is up now. I don't. Do you have energy for another one, or we we stop and carry on tomorrow? We will leave this till tomorrow. And we we don't want to rush too much. We need to think, make sure you understand step by step before we go on. There's uh, one other thing though. Um, there seems to be. We seem to have. a quite a bit of time before your exams. Your exams are going to be in December, isn't it? So we've still got September. We've still got September, October, and November. Now, I, I haven't heard from the coordinator or the head of department exactly where everyone's going to stop. So far, we've got until... We've, there's after thermodynamics, uh, there's waves, and then there's sound. And then there's nothing after that. So I don't know if they're going to continue with electricity and magnetism. But anyway, it seems we do have a bit of time. So I'm just going to suggest before your quizzes, if you want, uh, we can have a revision. Uh, we can use one lecture for revision before your quizzes. 
Would you like that, or I just carry on with lectures? That would be helpful. <laughs> right. Then you'll need to t tell me in advance which le which lecture you. Good want. idea. Okay. But tell me in advance which lecture you want as a quiz. To be honest with you, I don't actually know when your quizzes come up. You'll know, you know better than I do. So if you kind of warn me a bit before, we'll arrange one lecture for revision. Um, are there any questions before we go? I think this is a bit long. So we better leave. So would you mind explaining a little bit on modulus of rigidity? The, I don't know what I don't know which modulus that is. You're talking of the Young's modulus, shear modulus, or bulk modulus. I, I don't know which modulus the rigidity thing is. It's not in your. Okay, you need to tell me which one it is. Is it stretching of a wire, uh, compression, or is it just? Where have you got this term from? From one of the questions on my question paper. Which question paper is that? From your It's a. Uh, Sir, is it not the other name for. Uh, what is this? Young's model? Uh, yes. I think, I don't know if it's the other name. I've come across, this, uh, across it. Um, it hasn't. I'll check in my books. I haven't seen it myself. But the three modulus is that we do. If it's a stretching of the, of the wire, this is Young's. I'll check, I'll check the naming as well. Then there's a shear modulus that we've discussed already, isn't it? Uh, so is that the same as elastic modulus? Okay, well, uh, yeah, I see what you're saying. Yes, maybe. Let me just do the three modulus and I'll, I'll come back to elastic modulus. And then is the and this one is normally compression. You normally can so, squeeze things. So it's the other name for shear modulus. What? Uh, before we go, let me. The elastic modulus is is an important thing. These three things are called elastic modulus, elastic moduli. If you want the pro, 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 pro can't say it. Pro, I can't say it. Moduli. Uh, these are all elastic moduli. Now, the modulus of rigidity, I have to say, I'm, I'm not coming across that term. Um, has anyone else seen it in a book? I've does come it, across it. Does it's it the it's other name for shear modulus. Modulus of rigidity, I suppose. Let me, I can check in the book now if you want, or I can check myself later. Let me check later because uh, it may take time for me to look up. Um, so you're saying it's come you come across this in an exam, one of our UNS exams, is it? Yes, sir. All right. In that case, I'll, I'll check to see what uh, I'll check to see where it's come from. Is it Bush again? I don't have. By the way, I don't have Bush. Um, the one I do have. There is one bush I have, but it's one with, with height in it as well. It's this one. And this is a very nice book, by the way. I don't know if you've come across it. This is also, um, one of the authors is, is Bush, which is the same as your book, isn't it? Yes. Uh, and then Eugene, I guess you guys have come across the Shome series, have you? There's this yes. series of books. Uh, I have to say these are excellent, and this college physics books, this college physics has some lovely examples in. In fact, I get uh, the examples, I, I tend to use this book for some examples. Um, it's a very nice little book. Uh, sometimes books like Surway have so much detail in. Uh, these ones contain a lot of examples, and they're very nice. There is another one on a different subject, which is excellent. But those of you that will do physics should get it. There's a shown book on vector analysis, vector and tensor analysis. And that's another superb. In fact, 
so many of these shown books are excellent. Uh, okay, so with that, any other questions before we go? Any other questions or we, or we stop? All right, I don't hear anybody. Uh, stop recording.